Jason Maguire, retired jockey, race manager to Paul and Claire Rooney, and uh, run Ivy Lodge Farm, which is pre-training and breaking, and a rehab yard. I come from Kilmessen, a village called Kilmessen, County Mead. Um, we grew up there, um, started off, we were doing plenty of GAA. There was a lot of cousins and uncles and stuff, and playing plenty of hurling and football and things like that. And then um, we had a couple of ponies and my grandparents, and uh, I used to get the bus down to school and things and do the ponies and started off doing that. My father he taught me how to ride and got me going. Um, he was working then for a fella called Pat Byrne in Kilcock. He had a stud farm there and mares and foals and he ran a few on the rules as well, he had a permit. So that was a, a great education, doing all that, breaking and tricking about with horses and learning trade there. Um, then we sort of progressed on doing a bit of pony racing. I um, had a 13 two pony years ago um, of uh, Declan Glenn, a fella from Galway. He was my first pony racer. Um, Great little pony, taught me loads. He was probably old enough when I got him, but taught me taught me loads and um, yeah, progressed then to, to sort of 14 too and had some good ponies. Um, there was a couple, they were hard ponies to, to, to ride, you know, when you're a young lad, but brilliant education and a lot of time now they were steering jobs. If I could hold them for the first mile, they'd be all right. <laughs> Rode plenty of winners, maybe 60 or 80 probably. Um, but yeah, I was lucky to have some really good ponies to ride and travelled up and down the country and my mother and father, you know, obviously tearing up and down the country and costing them a fortune, but to be fair, it was it was brilliant and it gave me a great grounding. Pony racing is, is one of the best educations you'd have. I mean, when I was doing it, Paul Howrigan, Jamie Spencer, um, there was loads of lads, there was brilliant lads, like Barry Garrity, all them lads grew up, like Adrian would have done pony racing. Um, I'm sure it was Mick Canan and Willie Supple and all them lads. Um, and it was, it was such a, just a great experience for a young lad to be able to, you know, ride in a race. And like a lot of them ponies going around, so they, they knew their own way, especially the young, the small, or the, you know, 13 twos. They knew where they were going. They probably knew most of the tracks better than the young lads riding them. And like, uh, you know, Peter Fatty, I used to ride against him. He had a pony called Wagtail. And my lad was called Magic. And should have two of them used to fight out the finish there every second Sunday. And, um, no, it was, it, was, it was brilliant. After pony racing, um, I was still working for Pat Byrne. And I was riding out with Joanna Morgan. And then Joanna Morgan held my license. Um, so yeah, we started riding the flat and Joanna obviously taught me a lot and then she um, got me into Mick Halford. Joanna was brilliant, hardy, hardy woman, brilliant teacher. Um, and you know, she used to organize lifts for me up to the races and stuff. I didn't have a car or nothing at the time. And you know, I'd often get dropped to places and then meet lads and you know, everybody was so helpful, you know, to young lads. Um, trying to get going, um, but yeah, jo Joanna, she she wouldn't mix her words now. She'd be hardy out, and a couple of times uh, there was a couple of lads got a bit of a shock when you try and go into the sauna at Galway or something, and your young apprentice walking into the sauna, and Joanna's in there trying to lose a bit of weight, but she'd give an odd lad a shock. But anyway, she she didn't mind. But no, Joanna was brilliant, brilliant, yeah, and Mick was brilliant. Um, gave me my first winner called Green Patriot at Dundalk um, and yeah, great man to ride for. I always had it in my head that I'd go National Hunt because um, obviously, you know, following the footsteps of Adrian. And he was only in his 20s when he won the Irish National on Amerta. I'll, I'll never forget it, yeah, we went, my father took me. So growing up, um, Obviously, we followed Adrian very closely, and you know he was very successful um, as a very young age. Um, he was obviously down with uh, Michael Horrigan and 
he had a lot of winners pint to pint and then stuff and then like when we I'll never forget we went to Ferry House um, on the day he won the national I think he might have been still amateur at the time um, and it would just you know for someone that you're related to to be so successful at a young age just just couldn't really get my head around it um, but yeah I mean after after we sort of started riding over jumps and stuff. Adrian was obviously in England and I was in Ireland and things, things like that. But you kind of looked towards someone like Paul Carvery. He was gifted, you know, the way he rode a horse and settled a horse. Um, Timmy Murphy, people like that, you just, you, you looked up to. And I suppose when you're a kid, everybody used to go around with red gloves like Carvery and try and get your arse as high in the air as you possibly could. So. It was all, yeah, I mean, he was sort of a lot of young lads idle at the time. I had my first winner over jumps for my father was with Pat Byrne. He was a horse called Petitioner. He won at Limerick, the old Limerick. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I was still very light and I was doing a bit of both. Um, but then we sort of, I suppose, got a little bit heavier and things and started Doing a bit more, I uh, went to Peter McQuarrie in Clane, and he was a great man to work for, and rode plenty of winners for Peter. I was riding for Pat Hughes at the time. Pat Hughes was trained a lot of winners. Um, Patsy Lynch, uh, he was my agent at the time, um, a great fella, and he he done a really good job getting me on horses, and and I kind of I rode for Michael Horrigan, you know. I'll never forget, Paul had a fall, he broke his leg. I was second in the conditional jockeys just behind him, and Michael was giving me winners. And he said, if I, if I got level, then we'd have to split it. But Paul beat me, he beat me by one, so I didn't, never got there. But yeah, no, I had a lot, a lot of winners. Tom and Mahoney, um, who got a lot of the lads' jobs in England years ago, I suppose he would have got Barry Fenton, uh, Adrian, Timmy Murphy, a lot of lads. So he was sort of always keeping an eye out for me to go over. Um, I was supposed to come over a few years before I did to sort of ride on the flat and then I, that didn't happen. Um, and just, I suppose, like it happens to a lot of lads in Ireland, things can dry up and you lose your claim. Um, I think it was summer of 99. I was after going to Australia to do the, the jockeys challenge and then when I came back from there it was just yeah I was claiming three things had dried up and it was a case of doing something about it um, so yeah I came over to England to Tom George um, Tom and Sophie were very good to me and I stayed there with them in, in their house for the co first couple of weeks and things and Tom got me a car and stuff like that to get me going and um, yeah, I've just got stuck in there and, you know, working in the yard and um, sort of back to basics and got going again doing that. Rupert Wackley was stable jockey and Tom Jenks. Um, Tom Jenks, he rode a, a good horse called Tremalt. I actually rode him in the National after he, he got round. I got him round, but he he could belt a fence or two. And I think it was the racing post trophy at Kempton he was in front with Tom Jenks one year and he turned over but yeah no he was a funny horse but yeah yeah so we spent seven or eight years with Tom a um, couple of seasons there we had you know 50 60 winners and some nice horses but we did have a festival winner at Galileo um, I suppose a year or two before then Tom went off to Poland and he bought 10 or 12 and just it was just something different, he tried to do something different, dip his toe in and you know it was brilliant for us that obviously we had Galileo. Um, I think it might have been only a second run, he won at Kempton and then he, he won at Cheltenham. He bolted up at Kempton and it was like unexpected as in you know he turned in and gave him a squeeze and all of a sudden he took off and then he pricked his ears, he was looking around everywhere. And so it was kind of a case of you know he's obviously lacking experience going to Cheltenham but see and to be honest with you he was a, a bit of a monkey and it probably, the hustle and bustle actually probably lit him up because afterwards, 
he didn't do a whole pile. Um, I'll never forget, it was his second last. I think it was Liam Cooper. Um, got a fall off one of John Joe's. Um, and he actually jumped the horse. And um, yeah, and then went on to win. But again, when he turned into the home straight, he looked around everywhere and kind of dived across the, the last hurdle. But he went away and won well, yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a shock and you kind of don't think it's real. If you, I mean, you sort of don't take it in. Um, and like the next day we're off to, to market raising. Um, so it was, I mean, it was, it was brilliant. I mean, the more sort of winners you have, the more you can enjoy them. Um, but like when you have that winner, it's like, this has actually happened. And then it's like, will it ever happen again? Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of lads singing Galileo and the Queen song in the 21 club that night. From, you know, riding for Tom, then went to Donald McCain's. Um, and at the time, Ginger was obviously still training. Um, so I rode for Ginger, f I suppose maybe it was definitely a couple of years only before Donald took over. Um, Ginger was, I suppose I was introduced through a family friend, Sean Bourne. He was big pals with Ginger and I think they would have bought Ambury House together and things like that. Um, so that was sort of the connection there to start with. And then, yeah, we just, I mean, we sort of started going up there a couple of days a week and things like that. And like Ginger would always have small sort of hardy horses midweek, but, and he'd, you know, run them over fences and stuff. And I mean, there was a little mare there called Chica Pig Ray. And she obviously, like, you know, she would have got handicapped, I suppose, on, on heavy ground and things like that, which she didn't like. But then, I suppose, when she sort of grew into herself, she was only tiny, but she she strengthened up, and I think she might have won five or six chases. And she was tiny. But yeah, great, great, you know, Ginger was a great man, as in, he wouldn't be afraid to run a 50 to one shot in a race, and, and he'd had, you know, serious belief in his horses. Um, and I'd imagine, you know, that's what's made Donald as successful as he is because, you know, his old, old man always had great belief in his horses and so did Donald. So then, um, obviously Donald then got, shortly after, I think it was Amberley House, when Graham Lee won the, the Grand National, um, Donald then, I think, took over shortly after that. Um, and yeah, we were having plenty, plenty of nice horses, um, plenty of winners up north, and Mr. Hemmings was supporting us there at the time. I think Cloudy Lane would have been the first one, um, and he he won. He won a couple of them fixed brush final races, and he won a good chase at Haydock, and he super little horse. Um, and then Mr. Leslie, Tim Leslie. He started obviously supporting the yard, um, and it was sort of an, financially it was um, an injection of some money to get some horses. And luckily, Peddlers Cross came along, and it was overturned and a lot, a lot of good horses. Um, Peddlers Cross was probably one of the first good horses that I've ever sort of got off and thought this is a machine. I remember the first day he ran at Haydock, ran away at me for a mile and a half, and usually when the horse does that, you let go of him and he goes backwards, and he just took off. So we knew then that we had something special. Thankfully, Bala Briggs came along. I think he, I'm not sure what he was, he was definitely lowly rated, maybe 120 or something when he won the chase at Catrick. And from, from that day, we were aiming for a national. And it was a brave shout, Mick Meager, um, was, was stood in the, in the parade ring after he won and um, yeah it was sort of all roads for, for entry a couple of years later but we kind of he had the size and the scope and he was a brilliant jumper even though he did slip his first one over fences at Leicester um, but brilliant jumper great traveller of a horse you know he travelled really well and um, 
Yeah, thankfully, you know, he progressed well. I think the lads then obviously protect his handicap mark that season running into the national because he won a couple of novice hurdles and stuff. Um, so it was obviously a good, you know, race planning for, I suppose, a couple of years. Um, so yeah, it was it was brilliant. It, it it came off in the end. It didn't look likely because I was supposed to be in the first six and sort of save a bit and things and. He just ran with the choke out and I ended up being in front of the circle to go. So, um, yeah, the, the couple of fences down the side were dolled off, which gave me a chance to, to give him some breeders and sort of slow the pace up. Um, I remember Puppy Power was beside me and, and then we were turning in, into the home straight. I had Harry Skelton on the inside and he was on a dour stair and I was trying to get him to steady up as well. but. Um, no, thankfully he, he he hung on in the end. Halfway up the running, the horse was getting tired, and um, you know he managed to keep him going and get him over the line. And I suppose it was a warm day, and a lot of the horses were sort of feeling feeling the heat. And to be fair, Davy Russell was straight over buckets of water and firing them all all directions. But um, the horse was a little bit unsteady on his feet, so um, they took him away straight away and um, seen to him and. You know, got the vet to look at him, make sure he was okay. Thank he was fine. Um, so then, I, obviously, I was walking in then on my own with a couple of horses either side of me. Um, it probably took a little bit away from it. Um, and then, unfortunately, I uh, I had the old um, bell from the steward's room. I had to go in and explain my use of the whip. So at the time, uh, I think Frankie Dettori was after having a stick ban or something um, a couple of weeks beforehand. Um, and I suppose it was, it, the, whole, the whole thing was new, all the rules. And um, yeah, unfortunately I went over, at the time I think it was eight or, and you could hit, you know, I think I went 12 or, you know, I went proper over, um, which, uh, you know, these things happen if you go only there's only one Grand National and it's a, obviously a dream from a childhood dream for everybody so um, you know it's uh, I suppose the more education people get with the way whips are with the padding and stuff and things like that um, it's all the better for for the sport um, I think it's it's um, it's a big thing for for people to come even to go to yards to see how well they've been looked after. You know, you see here with the facilities that are horses, you know, like athletes have the same, you know, in their in their sort of, I suppose, what, you know, Manchester United and places like that have got all these top, top um, machines and stuff. So uh, the horses are, are no different. They're, they're getting treated second to none, so. And yeah, that was that was that. But took a bit of the sting off it, but that's life. I suppose, you know, sure when you're a kid and you're going around whether you're hunting or whether you're doing anything and if you're lads, you know, you're always sort of the national is the thing. You should be building fences at home and things like that. So it was always always something that you dream of doing and sure thankfully it's something I can tick off and say I did it. Cheltenham um is the best place, place in the world and the worst place in the world. If you're riding a good horse and you're able to travel and your you know your horse should be there, it's brilliant. Whether you know whether you win, lose or draw, it's a great place to compete. But when you're riding something that probably shouldn't be there or isn't able to travel, it's a nightmare because you just like driving a Mini in a Formula One race because you're just getting cars going by you left, right and centre, you're backpedalling, you've got traffic, you've got no light at your fences. It's an absolute disaster. And then, obviously then, you got disappointed owners because they expected better and it's just, yeah, it can be a, it can be a nightmare, but no, there's no, nowhere better if, when, when you're on a nice horse. Um, but yeah, we had a, a good mare. She was our first winner um, 
owned by John Glues um, and Brendan, two lads there that were sort of with Ginger from the start, um, and they had a tiny little mare called White Oak, and um, she was she was our first our first festival winner. Tough tough mare. Um, I hit the front too soon again. And AP came to do me, and then I think his horse was just had her head up and mine had his head down and managed to get back there. But yeah, no, it was, I was great times there. You know, there was a lot of good horses at the time, and just very lucky. I mean, Overturn, like his record speaks for himself. He was a super little horse. He won a Galway hurdle, and you know, he won all them all them big handicaps on the flat. Um, he was just super horse. He was second in the champion hurdle. You know, real tough, tough little horse. I walked the track with Chalk, and he was riding. I think it was Many Rivers to Cross. I think it was the name of the horse. Um, but I just, I just, I said, I just, I just thought. I said to myself, I, he'll win. So I just couldn't see any. And usually, I wouldn't be confident. Sort of, I'd always look. You know how a horse would get beat and try and stop it but I just couldn't um, couldn't see him get beat and like when he won obviously it was just it was good because the business I suppose with um, Donald McCain was sort of getting going and getting bigger and better and it's sort of giving you the confidence that you knew what a good horse felt like and you knew that if you did have a good horse that you could actually go and, and do it um, because you know the winners previous, I suppose, like Galileo and White Oak, they were outsiders, and it was, you know, it wasn't really expected. While we expected Peddler's Cross to win, and if if he didn't, then we'd be a bit like, well, well, maybe we're not thinking in the right way, you know. Um, so yeah, he was definitely the. the the, the um, best winner I had. Cinders and Ashes, he was another good one. I mean, he was a cheap purchase um, by Ginger. And he went through the ranks, won a couple of juvenile bumpers and stuff. And then um, Ginger sold him to Dermot Hannafin and a couple of his la pals. Um, and he, I mean, like Donald was very confident at the end. He said, you know, do, don't hit the front till going to the last. And now everybody knows I like hitting the front probably three out and sending them on. But he, um, I managed to hang on to him going to the last year and just, just went to the front, just about four strides from the last and he kicked the last out of the ground. Um, but thankfully he picked up again and away I went and won, yeah. Obviously Bangor would have been McCain's local track. So we had a lot of winners there and it was, I mean, we used to take horses galloping there and stuff after racing so horses knew it like the back of their hand and Donald used to always tell me stick to the inside because obviously there was the ground was always a bit drier there and yeah I mean White Oak I think she actually got beat there I hit the front too soon again on her she ran around and got beat uh, Peddler's Cross won there he actually won his novice chase there as well uh, Timmy Murphy rode him on his first novice chase I was out injured so yeah, Bangor was was a nice, good track, um, sharp little track, but good track. But often um, places like Newbury and places like that, big big galloping tracks, lovely tracks to ride on. Leperstown, Leperstown's a lovely track, you know, big fair track, lovely track. Navin, had a few winners at Navin. Um, I did come back to Cork. Um, and rode a couple. I used to come back there and ride for Gordon Elliott. So I had a couple of winners there in, in Cork for for Garden. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of horses there. I mean, the day Peddler's Cross got beat at Kempton, could a first time over fences, like Sprinter Sacker beat him. And like, we were absolutely sick. But then, it turns out, you know, um, it was a shame. Um, Overturn, you know, he was such a little star. It's a shame he didn't, um, you know, get to the heights of winning at the festival. He's obviously placed in you know, the champion of Hurdle and um, today he ran over fences 
he was a brilliant jumper, but he just he made a bad mistake too out and kind of knocked him, knocked the stuff out of him. But uh, there's been, been plenty, plenty of good horses. One of the nicer horses um, over fences for Pat Hughes, Lantern, I think his name. Um, he won around. He won impressively one day around Nace, the first time over fences. Um, but he was a he was a fair horse now. Um, back you know at the time when I wasn't riding loads, um, especially over fences, he was. He was yeah he was a. Not sure whether he might have run in the. He might have run in Cheltenham in the four miler or something, but. Yeah no he was he was probably the first sort of feel of a good horse. Um, I had a few winners from Mouse Morris, um, a couple of nice horses, New Call, I'll never forget, got beat one day and, um, at Nace. Hit the front too soon again. Sorry, Mouse. But no, he was, he was a good horse. So yeah, plenty, plenty of good horses. Wow. Oh, I get an awful habit of kicking on. But it suited England. Maybe that's probably why I had to come to England because <laughs> it suited England. I never forget. Well, David Casey and Ruby Walsh used to be always on to me. We'd sit quiet going to the last because I was always one for setting sail. But and yeah, things have passed now. 2014, the day before Cheltenham, I was riding at Stratford, and. Oh, I had a couple of rides there. That well, one horse for John Quinn in a handicap order, or an obvious one. I can't remember. But I obviously, wasn't thinking about what I should have been thinking. It was Stratford. Obviously, thinking about Cheltenham the next day, and got a fall, and it was no fault of the horse. He kind of half grabbed at the hurdle, and I fell out over his head. And the next minute. Sure, I got a kick in from the from behind, and um, oh, I, I thought I was just winded. I thought I'd be fine, and uh, I was asked. I actually asked him for some morphine or whatever, you know. So when you get a fall, sure, it's the best thing for you. When you when you're lying there, you get a bit of stuff and you'll be fine. But anyway, they wouldn't give it to me, and it turns out I was bleeding inside. I lacerated my liver, and. Um, Jesus, I was, in a, I was bad. I was, in, I was in intensive care there for oh, four or five days, and they rang. Niall Hannity was actually staying here, um, and his dad, and they rang my missus and, and they rang Hannity and Gordon Elliott. So they all sort of came up to Coventry because they thought, you know, the way I was bleeding and stuff inside was going to. But anyway, I was, I suppose after a couple of days, and I had a bit of a, a blood transfusion, it sort of sorted me out a bit. But I had a big scar and sort of staples and things like that. But that was sort of the beginning. I went back riding after that, but then I ended up having a couple of operations on my back because I was getting slip discs and things. Um, and yeah, I suppose that was the beginning of the end, I suppose, then. But then I rode for, I suppose it was well, the following season then, um, yeah, just yeah, you know, I was always sort of plagued. I had three operations, discs and things, and then they said I needed a fusion, but I couldn't ride with a fusion because it was my lower back. Um, so yeah, that was that was the end of that. Came back after that, yeah, but obviously I had back trouble because when they, I suppose, I suppose like, now day in, this day and age you probably be able. To, do it better um, and get your core muscles back and things, but I suppose we weren't, we weren't, I wouldn't say, well, I suppose dedicated to the gym like lads are now. Um, and, you know, I did a lot in Oxy House and they were really good down there, but it was just getting the strength to stabilize my back, the muscles and things, because um, obviously they cut away a lot of the sort of core muscles and yeah it, it just it, it, the whole thing was just weaker and yeah discs just gave me problems then yeah it's been grand right away there um as long as they ride long 
because it's, it's at all to do with the nerve systems. I, I used to get electric shocks in my, in my feet. Um, and it was to do with the nerve endings from the discs because they obviously would be compressing. Um, but yeah, if I was riding a couple of lots, you know, riding short and things, you, you'd feel that your leg, my leg does go numb anyway. Um, but yeah, as long as I ride long, ride long, live long, that's what they say, isn't it? Yeah, and obviously it was very disappointing, but at the same time, I was lucky enough, those owners um, at Donald McCain's, they were after investing a lot of money, Paul and Claire Rooney, and I was sort of looking after the horses for them at the time. And um, unfortunately, they split from Donald McCain, and I ended up then looking after the horses when they were in different trainers. So, it, you know, I obviously had a job then to go at. Um, and we had this place then just with a couple of stables and things. So it was always the plan to do what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but obviously uh, with massive help with, you know, working for Paul and Claire Rooney as well. When Paul and Claire Rooney split from Don McCain, um, they obviously had horses with a number of different trainers up and down the country and probably were looking after, I suppose it was probably over a hundred horses. Um, but now they're concentrating on the flat. Excuse me. Um, so they have about 25 maybe. Um, majority of them with sort of Clive Cox and Mark Johnson, Dave Evans. So um, yeah, the, I mean, enjoyed the jumping. You know, they bought a lot of stores and were very successful. There's a great wood winner with uh, If the Cap Fits and. Um, he won the entry and that was a great day and obviously had the second in the national um, last samurai. Um, so yeah, a lot of numbers and a lot of horses and now it's 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 obviously a little bit smaller um, but still have some, some nice horses and they've um, so had some good horses on the flat recently, yeah. I'd get a buzz whether it's a race is a race and you know you try and as as Gordon Elliott would say put your horse in the worst companies you can get and yourself in the best um, because you know you always try and get the horse to to win the easiest race and I mean the trainers that you know we deal with obviously they know racing inside out so you don't have to tell them and we just try and find the best race is suitable for the horses and yeah I mean whether it's jumps or flat you know at the end of the day it's it's a horse race and we're in it for to win so after 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 we won the national um we were st still living in Stroud at the time which is six miles down the road um and obviously we were trying to f find somewhere for a bit of land which is not easy um but we managed to find this place and it's it's about, I suppose it's six, seven miles outside of Cheltenham. Um, ideal location, a lot of yards around. I suppose Lamborn's probably two quarters of an hour. Um, you got Kim Bailey, Fergal O'Brien, um, Nigel Twist and Davis. There's a lot of tra trainers in the area. Um, so yeah, it was always the plan sort of to go and do a bit of breaking and pre-training and stuff. The, the, the rehab side of it works really well. Um, I suppose, you know, the eventing people, they, they tend to be keen on it as well. Um, like some people would drive over just to use it for the, for the half an hour or so and then... Um, but we tend to see a lot of horses come from, if they've had a hard couple of races and they've run off a bit light, um, we tend to see them come and just have a break for a couple of weeks, be turned out in the paddock, go on the treadmill, you know, if something's lost its appetite, get them eating again. Um, there's a lot of horses obviously on gastrogard and things like that these days and uh, they suffer from ulcers and things and so it's just kind of a de-stress and just get them back rubbing again I suppose and feeling, feeling, feeling okay. Oh, the buzz from winning. Yeah. Nothing, no, you just, I suppose I was lucky that I still have an involvement in the racing 
um, with Paul and Claire Rooney because obviously I, I wasn't going to go down training or do nothing like that. So I didn't have that kick. Um, but the horses winning for them means as much to me. Um, and I'm lucky that, yeah, I, I get a, you know, a massive kick out of them having winners. But I think over here, there's just too many, too much racing. You know, I think, um, like if you see a home there in Ireland, you know, the weekend race and stuff, there's a big, you know, there's more of a buzz around it. Um, I think if they had less racing, they could make more of the racing that they have you know, towards the weekends and stuff. And I think it'd be just, you would get more people sort of excited about it. I think when it's just on, it's constant, constant, constant. And it's just, it drives everybody, whether it's, I suppose, you know, from staff, trying to have a family life and things is, is, is hard. Um, it's just the same old thing over and over. Um, sometimes less is more. I mean, in Ireland, everyone, you know, you, you drop in, you get your horse settled, you get him jumping and, you know, it's all about, I suppose, getting him to stay the trip and over the last couple of furlongs, you know, then the race sort of quickens up. While in England, it's all about the start. I suppose a AP, another one of my idols, you know, when I came to England, he was sort of someone you'd look up to, but just the way he was a uh, complete horseman, Aggressive in his ra in his style, but could do anything. Um, and as, you know, I suppose him and Martin Pipe changed the way racing was ran. As, you know, he always had his horses well schooled, and all of a sudden he was away. And after two hurdles, a lot of the time race was over. So yeah, I, I, England was a, a lot different. I suppose riding in Ireland to starting off it like around them big tracks, Punchestown and. Navin and I mean the experience you'd have with 24 runner fields lads you know but even before riding and stuff the amount of schooling races and stuff lads would get get in and get used to and the experience of doing that as a young lad you know and especially like when you when you turn up to school races like Garrity or Car Carberry or you know all the top lads Connor Dwyer and all them lads would have been there and you're you're a kid, sort of in a in a group of horses with these top flight jockeys. It was it was just brilliant experience. Yeah, I wasn't riding loads when I came over. Um, obviously I was working in Tom George's and and like so Timmy. Timmy was a great fella, you know. He'd always look after young lads and stuff. He was wild and all the rest of it, but he good heart. Anyway, he um we used to he used to take me down to Jim Olds and go riding out with Jim Olds. For sure, I mean, the more times how we, how we actually got there in the mornings was, because like, I suppose when we finished, as Timmy would finish riding or something, I'd either go down and stay, because I used to go down and stay with Adrian and Sabrina, and they were obviously local. There was a lot of lads that used to live at Farrington at the time. Um, Glenn Tormey was with, down, he used to live with Timmy, and. And yeah, I used to go down and stay sometimes, and then I used to go into gyms. It was probably on a Monday, so probably a weekend of beer, and then poor old Jim used to have to put up with me and Timmy trying to. But to be fair now, they always jumped well because Jim Old was a great man for schooling horses and stuff. So, but yeah, some car car journeys there in the, on the morning. I think they've got a good system with. Um, jockey coaches and things over here now. Um, and I think um, the lads are obviously a lot more dedicated. I suppose it's different, you know, different. I suppose I was kind of, um, things were just starting to change when I was sort of beginning to retire, you know. So I suppose that when I grew up, it was, you know, Timmy Murphy, Paul Carberry, that sort of era with all them, all them lads. Um, but nowadays it's a lot more professional, which I think is a good thing. Um, lads are riding for longer. Um, and yeah, I think the jockey coaches are, are good. You know, it's, 
years ago, if your old man gave you a bollock and you'd sulk about it, whilst if somebody else had a word with you, it just comes a bit differently, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, I think, um, well, not really, I suppose I couldn't, I wouldn't change a whole lot. Maybe try not be as, uh, as wild as I was, but I suppose you have to be a little bit like that, don't you? I suppose like lads say, oh, you know, speak when you're spoken to, or, you know, this sort of thing. But then young lads, sometimes they need a bit of confidence. You know, the old years ago, it was like, you sit in the corner, you speak, you speak, you, but nowadays, if you've gone around too shy and not come, because like when I started riding and coming into a parade ring and with owners and stuff, you'd always be a bit, and people would say to me, you need to speak, because riding is one thing, but actually, you know, coming in off a horse and being able to look somebody in the eye and speak to them is, is a huge thing nowadays. Um, so I do, yeah, respect your elders and listen because they've obviously been there and done it and so yeah, take advice from, I suppose, people you admire and respect your elders, yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't have much hobbies, I didn't really when I was riding, probably I tried golf and things like that but didn't, didn't really agree with me, um, bit of squash maybe now and again but um, it's just nice to go, you know, to go off there with the kids and my wife Lauren and uh, obviously the kids have got some ponies now and do it, do it with the ponies and try and get them as interested as I was and give them an education like my mother and father gave to me.